And so they go marching in with their weapons into the temple treasury and just take out money. And it's very clear that everybody is outraged. We really, really have a problem with this guy, Gessius Flores. Can, can you get rid of him? So Vespasian wraps up Galilee very quickly. Then in 68, he moves down to Caesarea, and that's when Nero dies. Nero dies in June of 68. So Vespasian has already garrisoned Judea without any real resistance. Galba he manages to take over. He doesn't reach Rome until like October. And he finally realizes he's got to name somebody as his heir. And he chooses this guy, Licinianus Piso. They're both murdered on January 15th. Otto, who thought that he should be the natural heir. Vitalius also had arisen. So when his men acclaim him Imperator, it's conqueror, they wanted him, Vespasian, to lead them against Vitalius. Right? They assumed that he would be their commander in the field because he was their commander in Judea. But what he did was he worked out a deal with Mucianus, the governor of Syria, who would actually lead the Flavian forces to, to Italy to fight against Vitellius's forces. He, he's a very cautious, very clever, and, and self-protecting. And he waltzes into Rome when it's all been completely settled and calmed down and all the, the, the bloodletting is over and he can just take control. Welcome back to the Gnostic Informant and you are about to attain true Gnosis. Today I'm with Dr. Steve Mason and um, if you haven't watched the previous episode with him, we, we, we talked about Josephus, uh, we, kind of we're all you know just talk, talking about the book uh, Jewish Antiquities and started off with like talking about Noah and then we got into like you know Caesar, Sosius, Pompey the Great, sacking the temple and we were just having a you know just doing an overview on the book we, we covered a lot of ground in that episode and this one I want to focus in on some a certain time period which is the Roman Jewish War and so to, to tie it into the last one, I think we ended up talking about how things started to actually look look good. I mean, Augustus and Caesar, they put their, their friends with Herod and they're allowing the Jews to basically, you know, keep their keep their their laws and their sabbatical year where they can have a whole year. They don't have to pay any taxes and life seems good. And so I guess my first question is, how does this get messed up? What happens or? What what exactly happens be between? It seems like everyone's letting each other be, and then all of a sudden there's a war breaking out. Yeah. Well, that's that's the big question, Neil. Um, I mean, in scholarship, I have to say right at the beginning, there's a kind of fork in the road uh, in terms of method as well as results. So the different method you use brings different results. How you approach this thing, so. Basically, there are two main directions. One of them is huge in scholarship. One of them is small. I belong to the small group. Uh, so I'm going to describe first how I understand the common view. The common view is that Jews were never happy under foreign rule ever. So what you describe as the, the kind of happy days under Augustus and Herod, and all of that, this, this school would say that was never going to be okay. Uh, from the time that the Romans arrived in 63 BC under Pompey the Great, from then on, misery, uh, if not before. And the reason is, according to this school, that for a few decades before that, the Jews had had a, a more or less independent state. It was small. But it, this was the Hasmonean or Maccabean uh, kind of kingdom. So once they lost that, once they lost that independence, it was kind of mitigated independence, but still it was a kind of independence. Once they lost that, this way of thinking goes, uh, they were not going to be happy. And they were chafing constantly under 
what is presented as oppressive Roman rule, whether directly or through King Herod and his sons as Roman puppets. And th in this view, in fact, I was just reading today, again, a book that I know well, but I was looking at it again for a project I'm working on um, by Martin Hengel, the great uh, late scholar who wrote a book called The Zealots. And his whole, you know, it's a big fat book, and his whole picture is to create this idea, uh, well, he finds it in his view in history, that there were, the, 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 there was this Im immense freedom movement, as he calls it, right from uh, day one, but it was reactivated in uh, 6 CE, 6 AD, when Judas the Galilean revolted against the census that took place, it's mentioned in the Gospel of Luke as well, the census uh, when Judea was put back under direct Roman rule. So this really uh, very, very common view in scholarship is that the war that broke out in 66 was really only the, the popping of the cork of uh, constantly building tension and restlessness and chafing under Roman rule. So that's, you know, people should be aware that that view is still extremely common in scholarship, in very uh, respectable, uh, dignified scholarship is not a fringe view at all. Uh, nevertheless, I think it's mistaken. Um, and why do I think that? Well, it's because of method uh, res produces different results, right? What's your method? This method, the, the method that produces that picture, I would say, comes with a set of assumptions and a kind of a theological view, right? There is uh, this idea that Jews cannot tolerate foreign rule. And Flavius Josephus mentions a couple of people who he claims had this view. And scholars join the dots. Uh, and say, okay, this goes way back to the Bible. It goes back to the beginning, back to, to, to you know, the, the election of Israel that they could not tolerate foreign rule. And then you can draw a line, a kind of theological line, all the way through. In my view, these studies tend to uh, conform the evidence to this thought, to this idea. If you do it the other way around, which is my preference, let's just begin with the evidence, um, begin with what we have and see what we need to think happened in order to explain that evidence. Uh, I think you end up with a much more uh, uh, minimalist view of any tension. So what do I mean by that? Well, it seems to me, and to, uh, I'd say, a relatively small other group of scholars, that um, things were actually pretty good for Judea um, for the reasons you began to say. Uh, Augustus and King Herod were, if not as buddy-buddy friends as Josephus claims, uh, still, clearly, the, uh, uh, Herod was in place for a long time, for more than three decades as king, and that means that Augustus was pretty happy with him uh, and then wanted to put one of his sons. Now, Herod made it difficult because he killed a few of his sons. So, <laughs> like, you know, uh, the, the, the older and more eligible ones were already gone. But even still, Augustus said, well, he's got three young sons left in their early 20s. And he says, OK, well, let's divide up Herod's kingdom among these three and give the, the choice area to Archelaus and see how he goes. And if he goes well, he's only like 23 or something, but if he doesn't make a complete hash of it, maybe he can be king like his, his dad was. Um, so Augustus is, is really willing to ride this, this train. And what it means for Jerusalem and, and Judea is that they dominate the entire Southern Syria. Like if you think of Syria as the greater Syria, as the entire east coast of the Mediterranean, right? The, the entire eastern strip, the literal, of the Mediterranean. The southern half of that, from Lebanon down, from south of Lebanon downward, southward, 
is is under Jerusalem's control. Right. Right. Uh, and this is, I mean, if you're from Jerusalem, if you're a Jew, a Judean, your what used to be your little territory, the hinterland of Jerusalem, has expanded right. to include this entire region. The army is based in Jerusalem. You have a Judean Jewish king, right? So Jewish law, Jewish customs are extended. Now, Herod, unlike the Hasmoneans before him, the Hasmoneans also conquered the southern uh, part of Syria, but they forced everybody who stayed there, who, who would remain, to follow Jewish law. Uh, so if you are male, that meant undergo circumcision. Uh, in any case, keep the Sabbath, uh, keep the, the dietary laws more or less in some way, but generally follow the Jewish calendar, Jewish laws, if you're going to stay in the region. And King another, Herod, didn't, Herod didn't do that. He said, uh, okay, I recognize that you all are not Jews, um, so you will live under my kingship, but hey, I'm a generous guy. I, uh, I recognize all your customs and your ways. So I'll give you money, you know, I'll, I'll build, I'll uh, help you build temples. Uh, in fact, outside of Judea, I myself will build a temple to, to Rome and Augustus, one in Sebaste, one in Caesarea. Um, so he's, he's very flexible. You know, he's a very kind of worldly guy. In Jerusalem itself, he, he makes a big deal of the, you know, he rebuilds the Jewish temple and uh, makes the city a monument of the East, like right. this most uh, spectacular city, as Pliny uh, says in, in his natural history, it was like the jewel of the, of the East. Right. Um, anyway, so, so my, my basic point is that it looks to me like Jerusalem was, in fact, uh, riding high uh, yeah. under Roman rule. Yeah. And I was going to add to what you're saying real quick, just to sort of jump in. If you read Josephus' Jewish War, the first couple books, I think, maybe maybe book or two, is sort of like highlighting how great Herod's doing. Yeah. He's been in all these battles. He's like a yeah. hero. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. We, we only get the impression because of the Gospels that he was some sort of evil dictator who wanted to kill everybody. Yeah. But when you read Josephus, you're like, this guy is like a, a, a hero. He's like a war hero. He's he's really doing his thing. Like is, there's no, it's almost hard to believe that people would not like this guy based on what he's doing. Well, a couple of qualifications, basically. Yes, I agree in war in Josephus war. That's the picture of Herod. Uh, but two qualifications. One is that within war itself, when Herod dies and when he's about to die, it's very clear that there's a lot of opposition to him. Yeah. And uh, that opposition sends a delegation to Rome saying, please, Augustus, don't put us under a son of Herod. These guys are tyrants. Now, that, that's not in Josephus's voice. That's he's describing a, a delegation going. But still, he writes the story. So he makes it clear that there was a significant opposition to Herod. Second thing, a qualification is when he later writes the Antiquities, 15, uh, 18 years later, he uh, he himself, as a narrator, takes a more um, uh, critical, uh, even harsh view of Herod. Uh, he introduces him there in the Antiquities as a tyrant uh, and, and sort of bent on tyranny and personal power. He still keeps, because he, he writes a lot more about Herod in Antiquities. He writes like uh, nearly four volumes. Uh, there. So he has much more space to elaborate. And that work's themes are different from the themes of the war. So in war, he's trying to show how good the Roman Jewish relations were uh, yeah. un until the war. In, a, in antiquities, that's not his theme. His theme there is that those who follow the laws of God prosper and those who violate them suffer. And he uses Herod in that work as an example of somebody who often violated the laws of God and therefore met a really miserable end. Yeah. Uh, so he's using the same character in two different ways, as you often do in ancient history writing. 
Yeah. Uh, so anyway, that's a qualification of uh, of what you said. But I think still in war, yes, you're exactly right. Yeah. And, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Sebaste is a Greek word that means Augustus, Augustoria, or like a, a feminine form. Yeah. yeah. Sebastos, the masculine, is Augustus, and Sebaste, yeah. like Caesarea, yeah. they mean this. They mean the same, same thing. thing. Right. Yeah. So he so, got he's he's dedicating all these cities and yeah. buildings to, you know to the king i guess i don't know if you call him he's the emperor yeah, yeah. the emperor yeah 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 to augustus yeah yeah so yes. yeah yeah so okay so that's that makes a lot of sense you get he, he he's 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 very successful but he also has some op opposition and then after that so okay so let's 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 take the next chapter after that after he dies what what, what exactly is the situation in judea yeah. So basically what happens then is, uh, so Herod dies probably in 4 BC. Uh, it's some, it, there's some debate about that. Recently, some scholars have argued it's a bit later, or maybe as late as one. But the common view, and the view I hold to as the most pl plausible, is 4 BC. So Archelaus, his son, is appointed by Augustus, as I mentioned before, on a kind of probationary basis. He's not called king. He's called a ruler of the people, uh, ethnarch. Uh, and the idea is see how he get on uh, with ruling just Judea and Samaria and Edomia and a couple of other places around, but not the whole territory that your father had because uh, two of your brothers will get big chunks of that in the north and the east. You get the heartland and see how you make out with that. As it happens, the two brothers seem to have done spectacularly well with their territories. That, that's uh, Herod Antipas, uh, who has Galilee and Perea, the region east of the Jordan River, a strip of Judean territory east of the Jordan, and Galilee. And uh, Philip, who has the area east of the Sea of Galilee, uh, so like Trachonitis, Auronitis, and these areas that are now in the Golan Heights and then uh, and then into Western Syria today. Uh, so those territories remain stable for more than another three decades. So those two sons seem to do quite brilliantly well. I mean, we don't know much about them, but they seem to have done well because they lasted a long time into the 30s CE uh, after the death of Jesus. So would you, so, would you say that Tiberius is... Tiberius' reign, he's sort of just, it's business as usual, just like Augustus. Uh, yeah, pretty much. I mean, T Tiberius is a really interesting character. He, uh, you know, he, he seems to have been a reluctant emperor. He was a very uh, accomplished commander in the field, and he seems to have been a very smart guy, but he was also alive to many, well, he seems to have been rather cynical. Uh, there is a pretty bad press about him in Tacitus. Uh, uh, all kinds of lurid stories circulated also in Suetonius about his personal life and deficiencies. And it seems that he left Rome. He just left Rome. Uh, he couldn't really take it after a while and left others in charge. And really bad things happened for the last 10 years or so. Where did, his, he, where did he go? Alexandria? Uh, no, the island of Capri. Oh wow, he was yeah. gone. Yeah, 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 yeah. But so he just, then, according to Dio, he so when I from correct me if I'm wrong, I might be mistaken. This, but according to Dio, Augustus, who was so successful in his career, had a lot of problems in Dacia. I think it's Dacia, and yeah. Tiberius was like the savior. He's like, I'm going in the savior. He yep. got the legions back. Yep. He lost a bunch of legions. So yep. that's a big deal. That's a, that's like worthy of like a triumph, basically. Yeah, that, that's what I mean. He was an accomplished field commander. He was very, yeah, very good at what he did. Uh, he was sort of roped in. Augustus was looking for heirs, and they kept dying. And that, um, and that particular know. event is like that's yeah. the guy. Yeah, that's the guy. And so he ends up with uh, Tiberius, maybe a little bit reluctantly, his wife's son. Um, and uh, anyway. Uh, Tiberius had his trials and difficulties, but he seems to have been, when he put his mind to it, you know, if, uh, he wanted definitely to continue Augustus's uh, 
you know, uh, success because Augustus would become for everybody, even though he had a, a brutal and bloody accession to power, he would become in in memory <laughs> the best emperor ever. He was, uh, son, you know, he was the son of God too. Uh, yeah, but who who wasn't? Um, right, right, right. Yeah, right. I mean. <laughs> Uh, Julius Caesar had been, uh, I mean, they, they, that was pretty much part of the job, being, yeah. being a divine uh, descendant, but not divine. I mean, it, you, it was not cool in Rome to declare yourself a god, um, a living god. That happened after you died. That was an honor that you were given. So when, when uh, a ruler is called divus, divine, uh, that means he's dead. <laughs> that means... Uh, yeah. After he died, the Senate saw him ascend to heaven. Somebody saw a bird go up into the sky, must have been yeah. carrying the spirit. Okay, and, so. And in particular, this case, there was the comet Venus that should have been a bad omen. But, you know, the astrologers were like, we can we can twist this interpretation and make it good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, yeah everything was possible. Right, right. Uh, but, but, yeah. but you know what? I will say this. I want to get, I really want to get your opinion on this because a lot of these emperors are are deified and then really it's like why like like our claudius it's like who cares about claudius but caesar i think there's something i think there's a reason why i think people bought into this more because all of his conspirators all of the ides of march guys are pretty much avenged from by augustus who adopts yeah. the name of julius he literally was called julius caesar he he takes the name on well, so, he was adopted. I mean, it was Caesar who adopted him as right. his heir. Yeah, so yeah. in his will, he he said he, he wants uh, Octavian, Octavius Thorinus, whatever his name is, to yeah. change his name to Julius Caesar. Gaius Julius Caesar yeah. he has the full name taken over. And then when that happens, he avenges his father from the grave. And you got to think from the Roman people's perspective, that's pretty, that's great. That's a cool, that's like a really fascinating thing. Like, oh, Caesar, yeah. even from the grave, he's getting everybody back. Oh yeah. look, Brutus is dead now. Okay. Oh look, yeah. every, oh look, Augustus is now the sole emperor. This must yeah. be divine. This must be providence. I mean, yeah. Well, you... well, that's. I mean, Mark Antony did it also before, uh, before he got himself into the right. bad books. So, I mean, you know, he was also avenging uh, Caesar left, right, and center, that's and true. was very effective at it. But yeah, it all depends on the circumstances, right? So he gets himself into hot water with Octavian, and um, and uh, you have the Battle of Actium. So, and then yeah, but once once Augustus is in place, you know, there's a very interesting uh, uh, text on uh, clemency by Seneca, the philosopher, when he's advising Nero, and he's talking about how an emperor should be, you know, merciful and kind and this is the way to rule. And he, and he points out about Augustus. He says, you know, Augustus had this great reputation for being merciful and all that. Of course, that was after he turned the water red with blood at Actium and after he killed all his enemies. Then, yeah. you know, he was peaceful. And he's saying, why don't you just skip that part and just go straight to peaceful and, and merciful? You don't need to do all the violent stuff. Have you ever read from Philo? It's called On the On the Embassy to Gaius. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So you know what I'm talking about, where he's comparing Caligula, this monster. He, Caligula is like, worship me. Don't worship your God. Worship me. But he's based. But and then he says, this is Caesar who calmed the storms that were raising in every raging in every direction, who brought peace and brought. And and free the slaves, which is like no way. I think he took. I think slaves that ran away, he get he had them all killed or something like that. So really, that wasn't true. But anyways, Philo is painting. Philo is comparing Caligula to Augustus, and he's like talking about Augustus like he's the greatest thing in the world. Like he, right, right. Like he's godlike. Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. That yeah. Augustus became uh, the you know the perfect emperor in retrospect, and rhetorically that works very well for Philo. Right. Um, he, but even Philo says, even Philo admits or proposes that Gaius started off OK. You know, he was an all, he was a normal fellow, but he, he became sick uh, early on in his uh, his term as ruler. 
And this made him sick in the head somehow, and he completely changed and became a megalomaniac, uh, right, uh, after that. Yeah. Yeah, so Gaius is, uh, is the exception, as would Domitian be, and Nero to some extent. So, so Gaius, Nero, and Domitian would all be guys um, either murdered or, in the first and last case, or in Nero's case, commit suicide once he's declared an en enemy of the state enemy of the people um because they all become bad uh, as far as uh, as far as the roman elite is concerned uh they all go off the rails and become crazy people uh demanding some kind of worship demanding you know uh becoming tyrants essentially yeah yeah so do you think that has something to do with what happens in judea as well right um so let's get back to that then judea it seems to me i mean even uh even tacitus says that judea was quiet uh under tiberius and that's a long time that's from 14 to 37 ce yeah. uh that's everything's quiet same thing with claudius claudius uh you kind of suggested he was a non-entity i think uh in some way um and that that may be certainly if you've seen the TV series I Claudius, um, he looks like a kind of dithering fool. Um, <laughs> but but he uh, for all that, I mean, he seems to have been at least conservative and fairly wise. And from the Judean perspective, the Jewish perspective, he he was great. Um, that is to say, he intervened regularly to help the Judeans uh, when they when they had problems. Uh, so Agrippa was Agrippa the first. So Herod's grandson had helped Claudius come to power, believe it or not, because he happened to be in Rome at the time when Gaius Caligula was assassinated. And the story is in it's in more than one place, but it's in Josephus as well, that he didn't want to be emperor at all. Uh, he hid you know, because he feared for his own life. But it was the Praetorian Guard that sort of elevated him and said, we, we want a ruler and we want you. And he uh, acceded, even while the Senate was rebelling against this idea of having another, I mean, they thought, they'd, they thought this experiment in, in having emperors was really bad. And they wanted to return to the old Republic right. in some form or fashion, how that would work is not clear uh but they wanted the consuls the two consuls to have more power again and the senate as a deliberative body to have more power so so the texts tell us but it was uh it was agrippa who happened to be there and have friends on both sides who mediated and assisted a safe elevation of uh, of claudius and Claudius didn't forget it. I mean, he remained tight with Agrippa and with Herodian, other Herodian descendants who were in Rome. And this, this uh, helped the Judeans immensely. Also in Alexandria, you know, we have Claudius's letter. We have a copy. Well, it's not a full copy. It's a sort of crib uh, in, in Greek uh, made by a scribe uh, in Alexandria or near Alexandria of the letter he sent in 41 CE to calm the, uh, the, the conflict between the Alexandrians and the Judeans. And it's really a supportive letter. I mean, he, he lambasts the, the Greeks of the city and blames them for taking the lead in the hostilities against the Judeans. Wow. And he, he, he warns them, uh, you've got to lay off them. The Judeans have a right to be here. Uh, they've been here for generations. They have, you know, th this is, they, they, they can move around the city freely. What they can't, then he turns against the Judeans only to caution them to say, look, you have every good thing in this city, but it doesn't belong to you. It's not your city, right? It's not a Judean city. It, it has its own culture and laws and traditions, but you have a, a secure place here. Just don't push it. Right. You just don't. Don't try to get into things you're not allowed because you're not citizens of Alexandria. So you shouldn't be trying to visit, you know, the gymnasium or the, the citizen um, institutions. 
And you shouldn't be bringing relatives in from Syria, uh, where Judea is, or from other parts of Egypt to live here and expand, you know, the Judean community. Don't be doing that. But you have a good situation here. Just don't blow it. But he's really angry with the others who were acting against the Judeans in the riots of 38, um, and 38, 39. So he, uh, and, and he executes, he actually executes some of the Alexandrian uh, leaders uh, right. of, of the conflict. And this gives rise, by the way, to uh, a whole literature called the Acts of the Alexandrians, which is anti-Jewish wow. and, and anti-Roman because these people see the Jews of Alexandria as getting too much favor from the Romans. So um, all, of, all of these things suggest uh, that, um, that Judea and its main representatives, King Agrippa and his son Agrippa II, who grows up in Rome, uh, all had a pretty good connection with the Roman rulers, and Judea was, was relatively favored. I mean, if you look at if you look at southern Syria, right, you look at all the coastal cities, Gaza, Ascalon, Azotus, all the way up Caesarea to, you know, Ptolemaeus to Tyre. And then you look inland at the so-called Decapolis cities, Gadara, right. Gerasa, Hippos, um, and so on, Scythopolis. And then you look at the major populations, the Samarians north of Judea. Uh, in no case did the Romans ever choose one of them to be the regional kind of power, the regional base. They only chose Jerusalem and only promoted Judea. Wow. So for all these reasons, to come back to the beginning of our discussion, it seems to me clear that Judea prospered, uh, relatively speaking, uh, under Roman rule until the early 60s and to come back to your question then initially you know what what went wrong then but i was just trying to fill in the gap between augustus and uh yeah and no that was great that was great yeah so yeah so okay that makes a lot of sense we sort of have a picture now of what's going on the political scene and uh, is th is this office of praetorian you mentioned the praetorian guard if i'm not mistaken isn't there an Praetorian prefect that's centered in Alexandria, Egypt? Uh, no, um, but I'm trying to think of what you might be thinking of. The Praetorian Guard is a collection of cohorts in, uh, in Rome that are set up by Augustus as a kind of personal bodyguard. Um, right, okay. Uh, so there are, uh, I think, nine. Uh, nine cohorts, something like that. Um, it changes. It changes over time. And there are two Praetorian guard, uh, two Praetorian prefects. Pardon me, who are the uh, equestrian rank people at the top of this organization. And this is a very high-ranking position. Uh, so um, most of the time there are two, but at times there's only one, and that person becomes very powerful when there's only one. Uh, the idea of having two, of course, is like having two consuls. Right. Uh, so days. that, yeah, you don't have a tyrant running things. Yeah. But, um, yeah, Sejanus, uh, Sejanus is, uh, is the guy under Tiberius who he eventually executes because he runs, uh, he, he goes crazy with his power in, in Rome in the late 20s. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah, and the reason why I asked that, I'm, I'm thinking of a character who was with Titus, and I'm, maybe I'm jumping ahead a little bit. We can get to this, and we can set up this sort of story. But Tiberius Julius Alexander is his name, right? Yeah. And so this character is really so fascinating to me because I don't know. It just seems like he's like involved in a lot of a crazy stuff that's happening in this time period. Well, it's it's possible. It depends how you read. Uh... There's a fragmentary um, inscription uh, that may mention him and may describe him as Praetorian prefect. Uh, right. 
but that would be in that would be in the seventies. So okay. after Vespasian and Titus come to power, and Titus takes the role of Praetorian prefect um, in the seventies, which is amazing. That's too uh, much power for one family. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> if if Tiberius Julius Alexander is the Praetorian prefect. Uh, that would be extraordinary, and he would be Titus's uh, companion in yeah, that cause, role. Yeah, because yeah. they fought wars together, so that's like... Yeah, because he is close to Vespasian's age. He's close to the age of uh, Titus' dad. And when uh, Vespasian leaves the siege of Jerusalem to Titus in the year 70, he sends Tiberius Julius Alexander to be his mentor to be right. like his executive officer over the armies. Uh, but Tiberius Julius Alexander is way more experienced than Titus is. Titus is only 30 years old at that time. And Tiberius Julius Alexander is probably late 50s. Um, and he's, so who is he? He's he's the nephew of Philo of Alexandria. He's the son of- That's what I'm saying. It's just, yeah. This character is just so interesting, but yeah, sorry. Yeah, he, he, he's Jewish. He's a Judean, yeah. right? So he is some. He's part of this. Uh, what we're talking about, this connection of this network of very influential uh, Judeans. His his father Alexander was the financial agent of Claudius's mother. Wow. So, I mean, they're very well connected. And there's this whole there's this whole Eastern um, kind of um, aristocracy. Uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean that is, is all connected with uh, Alexander, the financial guy, uh, Vespasian, a young Vespasian is part of this circle, and the Herodian royalty are all part of it as well. And, and they're connected with Claudius's mother. So this is all, again, evidence of good Roman-Judean relations uh, during this time. So Tiberius Julius Alexander is sent by uh, Claudius to be uh, governor of Judea. Uh, so he's in, he has equestrian rank, and he is sent in the years 46 to 48 to be uh, governor of Judea. And this presumably, at, because uh, Agrippa I has recently died, right? He died in 44. And... Uh, this caused all kinds of upheaval in the land because the people who had been under Jerusalem's thumbs, under Jerusalem's rule, while like while Agrippa was king from Jerusalem as his base, uh, especially the Samarians and the people of Caesarea, where the auxiliary army was based, during this period, the army had to be under the Judean king. So like when there's a Judean king, Herod or Archelaus or Agrippa I, all the army is under his power, even though they are not Judeans, right? They are under the, the command and control of a Judean monarch. So when Agrippa dies in 44 CE, according to Josephus, all hell breaks loose with the army and their relatives in Samaria in celebrations, right? Because he's only like 53 or so. He was not expected to die. He just suddenly you know, collapsed and, and died. And they uh, unleashed celebrations, wild celebrations, rude celebrations throughout this they had street parties in Caesarea and in uh, Samaria because they were no longer under the control of this this Judean. So here's where the wow. tensions begin to rise. It's not between Jerusalem and Rome. It's between Jerusalem and uh, the neighboring peoples who have been under Jerusalem's control for so long, right? And the, the Judeans turn to Rome for help against them and protection against them. So, for example, in the early 50s, uh, you have a conflict between the Samarians and the Judeans breaks out. And uh, they appeal to Quirinius, or not Quirinius, Quadratus, uh, pardon me, who is the, um, the, the, the main governor, the high-ranking governor in Syria, 
And he comes down and sorts out the problem and sends their delegates to Claudius in Rome. And Claudius decides in favor of the Judeans uh, again. Wow. So it's so Judeans are appealing to Rome for protection against the local uh, auxiliary army, especially because these are not Roman soldiers, right? This is an important point for your viewers that, you know, uh, Judea is often presented like in the Life of Brian uh, film, if anybody's seen that, like there are Roman soldiers around everywhere, like legionary soldiers, famously, you know, in that film, uh, trying to teach Latin lessons to the, uh, to the Judean revolutionaries. But in reality, there were no Roman soldiers around anywhere, Roman legionaries. They were three weeks march away, way, way, way far in the north. The soldiers based around Judea, which kept the garrison in Jerusalem, were locally raised Samarian and Caesarean uh, soldiers. They were auxiliary forces. They were not Roman citizens. They were Greek speaking. They would get Roman citizenship after 20 odd years of service if they survived their, their uh, service in the army. They would be rewarded with uh, Roman citizenship afterwards, right, as a, as, as a benefit of doing all of this. But they were not Roman citizens and they were Greek speaking and their sympathies were with the local people. That's where they were recruited, right? So they were, they, they tended to hate the Jews because Jerusalem had always been their enemy, had always been, uh, you know, the con even in the Gospels, you see this conflict between Samaria and Jerusalem, the Jews and the Samaritans, yeah. in the Gospel of John and in the Good Samaritan story in Luke, right? And yeah. are these like descendants of the Seleucids, maybe? Like you said they're Greek people. Are they, are they just, or is that just like, maybe it's just everyone speaks Greek. Is that how? Yeah, that everyone, everyone speaks Greek. That's what I meant. They're Greek speakers. Yeah. They're, they're uh, kind of DNA. Uh, I don't know. It's too complicated. Yeah, to that's know. a good question, yeah. I guess. Yeah. Which is like, I always try to figure those things out, but they're like impossible to figure out. But yeah, anyway, yeah. so yeah, so now we have a really, so it seems like, I don't know how you describe it. Is this more like a civil war between people that are under a Roman world? Like this is more like bickering within rather than a nation of Judea against Rome. Does that well, make sense? In, in, in my view, yes, largely. I wouldn't call it a civil war because the communities were all separate, right? So sure. um, th there will be a kind of civil war within Judea too. But this uh, this kind of war among the neighboring populations is is a real problem well tensions let's not call it war yet but uh tensions among them which break out erupt into deadly uh, force sometimes so for example what kicked off that sumerian jewish problem in the early 50s was uh jews traveling from galilee through samaria to come to jerusalem for a festival were attacked and and murdered um, but this was a common, common thing, right? Um, we know it from Josephus uh, that there were two ways to get from Galilee down to, to, to Judea. You could either go straight, the quick way was straight through Samaria, or the long way was to go out to the Jordan Valley and go down the Jordan Valley and then come up via Jericho. Uh, so you get down to Jericho and come up into the hills. And it's long, and it's there are bandits in the hills, and it's dangerous. But people still chose to do that rather than to take the quick route through Samaria, because that was that was particularly dangerous. Yeah. So the, these are these robbers that Josephus alludes to pretty often. Yeah. 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 And and the New Testament as well, the Gospels. Yeah. Yeah. And so there's also this fire. This famous fire in Rome that breaks out that the Christians are blamed for. Yeah, sixty four. Yeah, sixty four. So, is this? Do you think this sort of like fuels the fire that ends up like creating this war? I guess you'd call it. I think it's a little bit earlier than that, yes. okay. um, but yeah. that exacerbates the problem. So the problem is essentially, I think this, and now I'll, I get to, I think what's the crux of what you're asking about. What changes, essentially the question is, what changes with Nero 
right? Because the war breaks out under Nero. So what yeah. changes with Nero? Well, it's of course tempting to to be simplistic about this, to be to reduce it to too simple. Um, life is always complicated. There are always many, many, many factors that enter into things. But it seems to me that some of the factors are are as follows. First of all. Uh, Nero comes to power at the age of 16. Yeah. Right. In 54 CE, by the, uh, apparently by the machinations of his mother, right? Um, who is uh, Claudius's most recent wife. Um, and of course, the story is that she even poisoned Claudius, poisoned mushrooms, um, somehow to get her son into office. Maybe, maybe not. Um, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, it could be. But those are the kind of stories that circulated when people had no idea uh, in the ancient world. So let, let's not put too much weight on that. But sure. nevertheless, whatever, however it happened, Nero comes to power at just 16. For the first five years, and this is kind of very famous and ancient writing about him, the first five years were fine. Uh, why? Because his mother was still around, and she had put him in power, basically, and had arranged kind of tutors and protectors for him, uh, uh, Seneca and Burrus, who, who looked after him and advised him, counseled him. And he, as a young guy, doesn't know anything, um, basically just has to follow in the pattern that Claudius had set. So he doesn't really change very much. But... There's, there's a noticeable change in 59 CE. So when he's around 21, um, he just starts to act differently. And uh, he kills his mother. He has his mother killed. He has many advisors killed or exiled. Um, he, there's a lot of really strange stuff written about him. A lot of strange he, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, there's also, there have been efforts to kind of uh, rehabilitate him in a way. A um, uh, book by Champlin on Nero is really, really very good, trying to make the best possible case for understanding the guy historically, you know, what he was really, what he was really about. But from a Roman point of view, he's an odd duck, right? He's uh, very much interested in the arts uh, and athletics and wants to be somehow, it seems like he had a frustrated, you know, ambition to be a great entertainer, artist, performer, athlete. Um, so anyway, he, after five years, he gets rid of many of his advisors and, and really pushes out on his own in a fairly marked manner, so to speak. And at the same time, he begins to uh, have a financial crisis around the year 59 to 60. So this is well before the great fire of Rome, five, almost five years before. And, you know, the, the big revolt in Britain is caused in part by his recalling of uh, what he now considers loans, which the British thought were gifts, right? Because he has been close to uh, uh, different British tribal leaders. Is this Boudicca? Yeah. Wow, it's a lot uh, of history ha happening in such a short period of time. Lots, yeah, lot of, yeah, yeah. A lot of big events, but yeah, sorry. I keep exactly, going. exactly. And he tells people, senior people, to call in there to recall the money they'd given as uh, gifts uh, now and said, no, they were loans and now they're due. Right. So, so the British tribes are like, well, we don't have the money. Uh, this is not fair. And that's part of, I mean, it's a complex story. There's also other things going on, but Part of the story about the revolt under Boudicca is the, the humiliation, right, that these Roman collect, uh, money collectors inflicted on these, these, these British royals, as it were, the heads of these tribes, and uh, it, which may have extended even to rape, according to some accounts. But anyway, uh, um, there, there's a conflict that develops because Nero is in financial trouble. And according to other sources, not Josephus, he begins to even tell his uh, financial men, procurators, financial agents, to raid temples. And these are temples everywhere, even in, in Italy itself. 
right? Go around and take whatever you can get from the temples. We need money. Recall all the loans. Recall every resource you can get. Now, it looks like it was a result of bad financial you know, management on his part. We can't really say now for sure, but it looks that way. So he's trying to get all this money. And in the, in the year 64 or so, when the great fire breaks out, he dispatches to Judea a, f- a friend, well, uh, a guy whose wife was a friend of his wife. So, I mean, part of the sordid story of Nero is that he, uh, he had a wife and then he fell in love with the wife of a friend of his named Otto, who would become emperor later. But he dispatched him off as far as he could get rid of him out to the west. And, uh, and it took his wife as a, as a lover, first of all, named Poppea, Poppea Sabina, uh, and then married her. In 62, he married her. So there are all kinds of lurid stories in the Roman literature about her evil influence on him as well, uh, and that she had him bump off various people. Uh, so he marries her in, 60, in 62. He will eventually kill her in 65. Wow. Uh, but when, when Josephus visits Rome, they are a couple. And he says that it was she. Josephus claims she was a God-fearer. She was uh, very supportive of the Jews. Wow. And she, she helped him when he went to Nero's court to free some Jewish friends of his who were priests, who uh, Nero had, had kept as, as prisoners. And uh, Papia, his wife, was crucial in getting them released to go back with Josephus uh, in the years 64 to 65, somewhere in there. So all of this is going on at this time. And it's a very uh, tense period. And, yeah. and after this, so after the great fire, uh, of Rome, of course, Nero wants to rebuild Rome, and so he has, um, like, his financial needs go through the roof, right? They skyrocket. He really needs to rebuild the city, he's in trouble. and he's really pressing everybody to get him money, resources, and that's the time. Well, sixty-four, sixty-five is when he sends this guy, Gessius Florus, as the procurator to Judea. And tells him, basically gives him carte blanche and says, just take money, get money from the temple. You know, the the temple in Jerusalem is known to be uh, one of the wealthiest, maybe the wealthiest temple in in the Roman Empire. Wow. Why? Can can you, if if you don't mind my asking you as if you were in one of my classes. Yeah. uh, Can you imagine why the Jerusalem temple would probably be wealthier than most other temples, like the thousands of temples throughout the empire. Because they raise taxes. Yeah. From? From the people, in, the Jews in the eastern side of the empire, right? Exactly. Yeah. And not only in the, in the Roman Empire, but even Jews in the Parthian Empire. Right. To the east. They, all of them. And they get only- that seventh year where they can just bank and just collect and stack for that yeah. whole seventh year. Yeah, That's yeah. A, people don't understand that. Can you explain that real quick? What the sabbatical year is? Well, actually, I'm not. I'm a bit reluctant to because okay. it's not clear how it played out in okay. in practice. Um, you have, it's just not clear how it, it worked in practice because according to biblical law, of course, in the seventh year you should let the fields lie fallow and you shouldn't grow and so on. Uh, and then you have rabbinic laws about tithing and and uh, the seventh year. But what actually happened on the ground in the first century, it's not so clear what accommodations were made for for the Sabbath. So I'm a bit I'm a bit reluctant sure. uh, to to go there and say it was like this. Uh, I don't know. But what is clear is that Judeans everywhere in Alexandria, in the cities of the Eastern Empire, a Roman Empire, and all the Jews of the Parthian world, and there were you know, uh, at least hundreds of thousands, probably millions of Jews living in, you know, Iraq, Iran, and those at Jordan and those areas. And they, not in the Roman Empire, but they still sent delegates every year with a mass of money 
to the temple in Jerusalem yeah. uh, because they the, the, that was their only temple. So whereas other people, you know, worshipers of Apollo or 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 uh, uh, Athena, yeah, they they had a temple in their own city, and they would store their money there. But that was relatively small, especially small. when you when you read Pausanias and you notice that. Every city might have two temples of Dionysus, or oh yeah, oh they're yeah, all over the place. Yeah, like, they might just... have do dozens of temples to yeah. different gods. Yeah, 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 exactly. So if you have one temple, in principle, I mean, there was a temple also in Egypt uh, for Jews, which is uh, a peculiar place, and we don't know much about it. Uh, Vespasian shut it down in seventy three, seventy four. But aside from that, um, which is which is a peculiar thing. Uh, Josephus is clear and Philo is clear and other sources are clear that the temple in Jerusalem was the temple for Jews everywhere. So when uh, Nero, of course, thought about it, he's seeing, well, not dollar signs, but, you know, Cistercius signs um, <laughs> in, in his eyes of, of money, right? And he, and he tells Gessius Florus, look, just go. And you've got to take some money out of there. And, and talents, you know, ta a talent was like the uh, size of, you know, in the gym, some some big, uh, you know, plate, like a 45-pound plate or something like that. I mean, they, they varied according to different scales. But that was one talent. And he has him go and take yeah, eight talents of gold or, uh, you know, so many talents. And, of course, who's his muscle to do this? Uh, he doesn't waltz in there himself and try to carry out this money. The, 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 the muscle is the auxiliary garrison. Uh, so not Roman citizens, not Roman legionary soldiers, but these people who have weapons. Uh, I say weapons, not like a machine gun, but, you know, the weapons of the time, uh, swords and Spears. clubs. And they hate the Jews. Um, that's just by now clear, right? In, in, even in Josephus's account, mainly in the antiquities, he fills in the backstory to this, not so much in the war. But in Antiquities 19, it becomes very clear that the animosities between these, these, uh, between the Jews and their protectors, the, the auxiliary army, is fierce. And so they go marching in with their weapons into the temple treasury and just take out money. So what happens now? Well, of course, you have the problem of how do the Jews respond to this? And it's very clear that everybody is outraged. Right. But that doesn't mean that this was part of a, his, you know, what I said at the beginning, like there was some anti-Roman zealot feeling dispersed throughout the population. Quite the opposite. When the Jews experienced this under Gessius Florus, Nero's agent who's just arrived, they are furious because it's never happened before. This is not what you expect of the Romans. And their, their immediate instinctual response is to appeal to Cestius Gallus, who is the, the, the top Roman commander in Syria, right? He's, he's the senatorial ranked uh, governor, uh, Legatus, and they appeal to him for help. And he, he comes down and visits at Passover in the year 66, right? Um, and and the, the, the Jews flock around him and he says, is everything cool? You know, is everything good? Because his job is to maintain good relations with the local populations. And they say, everything is great. We have no problem with Rome, but we really, really have a problem with this guy, um, this, this uh, Gessius Flores. Can, can you get rid of him? Wow. Now, in the, in the past, the guy in that position, the position of Cestius Gallus, has been able to get rid of the lower ranked guy, uh, the, the equestrian governor. So, for example, Pontius Pilate was sent packing back to Rome by the, the, the guy who was in charge in uh, Syria, right, uh, Vitellius at the time. So normally he could do that. 
normally he could use his much higher rank to say, right, you go back to the emperor and you give an account to him. But in this case, it didn't work. In this case, the problem is that by this time exactly in 65 CE, there are conspiracies among the senators in Rome uh, that are taking shape against Nero. They're actually trying to kill him because they see they see him as degenerate. Uh, he, right. he undertakes in this year a uh, famous uh, tour of Greece where he begins to uh, act on the stage, uh, perform in shows, participate in athletic contests, which he always wins, by the way, uh, amazingly. Uh -huh. Is this the same time period where Vespasian supposedly falls asleep yeah. while Nero is? Yeah. So yeah. what happened? So Vespasian is with Nero on this Greek tour uh, of of sixty five sixty six. Um, yeah, exactly. He's he's with him as part of his entourage, and he has to watch all this stuff. Like he, you know, he's a very accomplished, you know, tough guy. The war guy. And he has to just kind of sit in the audience and smile. And so, you know, he starts to doze. And the uh, <laughs> uh, one story is that he he just walks out of a performance. Uh, that's the situation in which uh, Nero will send him to Judea. He sends him from Greece, actually, uh, not from Rome. So does he, he doesn't banish him or like make him like, like I think it's Tacitus. One of, one of the writers was like, Nero was so angry that he could have killed Vespasian, but people convinced him not to. So it's yeah, sad, yeah, sad, yeah. Sad. I mean, these are the kind of uh, gossipy, gossipy stories that did it. You know, we, we don't really know. Yeah. Um, most emperors took this kind of stuff in their stride. You know, they, they had a sense of humor about it. Everybody's outraged at the thieving of, uh, of money from the temple treasury. Of course they are. But then the question is, how do you respond? You know, like, use your noggin. You know, how, what's the safest way forward now? And here you have a whole spectrum of responses right so on on one side the impulsive response is look these are not romans these are these schmucks that ha have hated us for so long these auxiliary fighters right we can take them on uh you know they're not such great stuff we'll go arm ourselves and so you have a, a split of factions led by different people but one of them goes goes down to masada where King Herod had stored a bunch of weapons, weapons, again, being uh, swords and clubs and, you know, staffs and just stuff that's made to, to fight with, um, is, is at Masada. So according to Josephus, they go down and grab a bunch of these weapons, load them up on a wagon and take them back to Jerusalem to arm themselves against the auxiliary garrison, which is only... Well, only it's a few hundred guys, right? It's usually around 500, 480, 500 guys who are, no, that, that's a lot of armed fighters. But if, if you can get together a few hundred others and arm them, it's, it's, it's at least a conceivable conflict, a contest, right? You might be able to chase them out. And, and these guys are really brutal. I mean, they're following Nero's orders. And Josephus even says at one point, when the Jews accused Gessius Florus of, you know, being a, a bastard for taking all this money, he said, look, I'm just doing what the emperor told me to do. Wow. Uh, in Josephus, he comes across as a really bad guy, but he does allow him to say that. And that seems to be true. He was just doing what Nero told him to do. And because of the to come back to a point I began to make before, because of the conspiracy of the senators against Nero at this time in 65, 66, he's very suspicious of, of senators. And some of them are governing provinces, right? And like the two guys, two brothers who are governing in upper and lower Germany, he, he invites them to kill themselves. <laughs> like, uh, okay, your life, your life is over. Please, uh, please die right now. Um, wow. uh, this was the honorable way to die, right? Instead of being executed. 
just uh, I'll let you guys kill yourselves. But I want you to know, you know, you, you have to do it. And, and from the East, a very senior guy, probably late 60s by now, named Corbulo, who had won a great victory for Nero against the Parthians and en enabled him to have a magnificent celebration in Rome in 66 CE of his uh, uh, um, agreement with Parthia, like a big diplomatic agreement. That was all won by Corbulo. Then, Cor then, then Nero invites Corbulo to, uh, to, to uh, Greece and tells him to kill himself as well because he's, he, he fears that he's involved in these senatorial conspiracies and he's a very powerful guy. He's got a lot of support as a great commander, whereas Nero is still, Nero is still not even 30 yet after like 14 years in power. He's still very, very young. And he knows that the generals and the real, you know, the real men, the real fighters, the real experienced leaders look down on him as a, as, as a goof, you know, um, cause, cause he doesn't have any, he doesn't have any substance to him, right? He's just right. Uh, a flake. Uh, so he knows that and he's very sensitive to it. And so he's ordering all these guys in their sixties to, 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 you know, end themselves. Um, so what that means for Judea is that Cestius Gallus, we've got to keep these names straight. Cestius Gallus is the, the senatorial legate in charge of all of Syria, including Judea. Uh, whereas Gessius Florus, whose name sounds a little bit similar, he's a much lower ranked equestrian guy who is Nero's agent to collect the money. Now, as I said, ordinarily, the senior guy would be able to boot the younger guy, the junior guy out. And so you go back to Rome and explain yourself to the emperor. That would have been the case under Augustus, Tiberius, Claudius. But under Nero, no way. There's no way that this senator is going to confront the man that Nero sent out, even though he's officially of much lower rank. Because Nero is, is using these guys, his, these equestrian financial guys, to undermine the senators. Also, uh, Galba, who's a, who's a senior senator in the West, in Spain, he, according to the stories we have, is very upset that Nero's men are coming and taking money from his province. There's not a thing he can do about it. He just has to zip it. Um, and that seems to be the same situation in Judea. So to come back to your question, Neil, the big question of today, um, how did the war break out? It seems to me that it's not so complicated, but it's in much more at a much more human level than this kind of idea, this theological idea, as I would put it, that the Jews were, were you know, zealots. They were resistant to Roman rule. They, they just uh, couldn't stand the oppression of Rome. I can't see it. I mean, I think that things were going very well for Jerusalem all the way until the mid-60s when, when particular events in Nero's uh, reign and from Nero's ambitions and Nero's wishes and needs, financial needs, drove him to uh, aggravate the situation in Judea in a new way that had not happened before. And all the normal ways the Jews would have for redress, the, no the ways they would normally appeal to the, to the legate in the north, they would normally appeal to the emperor for relief from whatever's going on in Judea. Those doors were closed now. And now they realized that the emperor was their enemy. He'd suddenly become their, em their enemy, not because of any fundamental conflict with Rome, but because Nero was behaving in such a nasty way. And they, they, they couldn't get any help from Cestius Gallus because he was, he was handcuffed. Um, he, he could not act a, a, in a disloyal way. Uh, to, to Nero, right? He just had to zip it and accept the, the junior guy. So, uh, now things just went from bad to worse. And, and I mentioned before there was a spectrum of responses. 
some people armed themselves and, and they went as far as to besiege the, the auxiliary garrison in Jerusalem and in, to hold it up, first of all, in the Antonia Fortress, uh, where, which was its main kind of base. And then they kicked them out, they drove them out of there into King Herod's old palace, uh, uh, which was also kind of had thick walls. And, and the auxiliary is hiding in there and trying to stay safe. And finally, they, they promised them, according to Josephus, it's the only story we have, right. uh, they promised them safe passage if they will put down their weapons. So they come out and put down their weapons, and then they massacre them. Uh, wow. So this is like, okay, <laughs> things are really getting out of hand now. And at the same time, according to Josephus, over in Caesarea, where there's always been anti-Judean sentiment building up, right? That's where they celebrated Agrippa the first death. He says that at the same time, the Caesarean majority population massacred its Judean minority. Wow. So you have uh, the Jews massacring the auxiliary garrison, which is from Caesarea and would be due to go back home there, and the people of Caesarea massacring their Judean minority. Now, it's natural to suspect one was a, a response to the other. Uh, Josephus doesn't say that. He says they happened at exactly the same time uh, by some mysterious uh, coincidence, yeah. uh, which is you know hard to believe historically. But anyway, they both happened. And the result was that uh, the whole region lights up now. And on, in terms of the spectrum of responses, however, it's clear that you have a lot of people, especially the more senior uh, priests in the temple, saying, okay, 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 we've got to calm this down. We've got to de-escalate this somehow. Yes, this is terrible. Yes, it's atrocious. But there's no point just fighting. I mean, that's not. we're not going to survive that. Um, we've got to try to calm things down. And so Agrippa II is brought in to try to help, and the senior priests try to calm things down. But long story short, it doesn't work. Would you say this is like the Franz Ferdinand moment? The or yeah. um, is that is that what his name? Franz Ferdinand. The, the guy. Franz Ferdinand. Uh, yeah, the the uh, the heir apparent in. Uh, uh, Austria-Hungary, who was... Yes. Yeah, so uh, this is comparable to that. This is the shot heard around the world sparks off this. this. Uh, well, yes and no. Yes and no. The, the difference is that with Franz Ferdinand and the Austro-Hungarian Empire, of course, I think it's very clear now that that the situation in Europe from you know the late 19th century to 1914 was extremely tense That's with true. these major powers arming themselves uh, and preparing for a massive conflict. And so that was the that was the you know the spark that ignited that conflict. Uh, so in that sense, this was a spark, yes. But I it don't think, much build up. Yeah, I don't think there was this there, there were not, you know, armies ready to fight each other. And so, when this happens, is Vespasian still in Greece with Nero, or is he getting sent out already? Yeah. So, so now what happens is, in a very short space of time, this guy Cestius Gallus, who's the governor of all Syria and is responsible for keeping the peace in Judea, he's really between a rock and a hard place. Um, and so he decides reluctantly, very reluctantly, it seems, in in autumn, when the weather's already turning, you know, in the highlands of Judea, it's already turning wet and uh, it's going to likely snow. And it's, it's I, I lived through, you know, a modern uh, winter once in uh, Jerusalem. It's amazingly cold. Oh, really? And, yeah. Yeah. Um, because there's no generally no really good, or there was when I was there, no really good central heating, and so you kind of went to bed with all your clothes on, and, you know, um, and and it it can often snow, and it certainly rains a lot from October, November through to like February, March, 
the rest of the year you can go with not a cloud in the sky from wow. you know March to October or so hardly ever see a cloud in the sky but through through the winter it's it's not a good time to be there so Cassius Gallus decides very reluctantly to take a, a legion south to sort this all out and he takes Agrippa the second the Judean king with him thinking okay well you know they'll let him into the city and he can you know we'll find out who the troublemakers are we'll sort this out we'll, right i don't want to do this but but here's the problem first of all the legion he takes the 12th legion is a rebuilding legion it was almost destroyed under corbulo um because of corbulo's i can't get into all the details but corbulo's predecessor really screwed up and and that's why corbulo came in to save the day with parthia uh, the 12th legion had been almost destroyed by the Parthians in 63. So, That's right. So uh, uh, um, uh, Cassius Gallus, in choosing that legion to bring south, he's, it clearly doesn't think it's going to be a big problem. He doesn't take his best legion, the 10th uh, Fratensis. He doesn't take that legion. He leaves it up on the, you know, near the... Um, uh, near the Euphrates River, which is the frontier with Parthia. He leaves the, those legions in place, but he comes down quickly and picks up from Raphanaya, which is on the way south, the rebuilding 12th legion, apparently to kind of give it some, 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 some experience, some, an easy kind of you know, minor expedition, right. policing expedition. So what happens is when he gets to Jerusalem with Agrippa, uh, as they're nearing Jerusalem, Agrippa sends a couple of his spokesmen ahead to say, okay, we're coming. Can you please open the gates? Uh, we we want to talk this through. And those two guys are, 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 one is killed and one is beaten within an inch of his life. And they escape back and say, no, they, they don't want us uh, to, to come. We're going to be in trouble. So now Kestius has got this legion with him. He says, well, we got to press on. So he arrives outside the gates of Jerusalem and assumes they're going to let him in. He's got a legion with him, after all. And he's, he was just in the city in the spring and uh, had a very warm reception. And people have been coming and going out of the city. So he, he's sure he can get in, right. but he can't. They, you know, it's a, it's a walled city and it only has a few gates and half a dozen gates. So when those gates are bolted shut and the walls are thick and high, you can't get in unless, I mean, even Titus, when he arrives years later with uh, with four legions for the siege, he can't just waltz in, right? It's, yeah, yeah. Um, you're, you're stuck outside. So Kestius finds he can't get into the city. And so he, has to, he hasn't got any supply lines. He hasn't, he hasn't prepared for a siege, nothing like that. So he has his men forage around for food for a few days. And then he decides, well, to hell with it. Uh, you know, we better go home back up north and we'll come back in the spring when it's uh, ready for, you know, fighting season. And I'll bring a couple of legions with me and we'll really sort this thing out. But <laughs> when he's retreating, he has to go through a steep pass down these stone cut uh, steps where the army has to go single file at a place called Bet Choron. Uh, which is where the uh, landscape descends quickly from the hills down to the plain, uh, down to the plain so you can head north. So it's a very short period where the army has to, like a kilometer or so, where they have to go very steeply down these rock cut steps. And the Judean fighters are feeling very uh, confident now because they, they feel like they've chased them away. They, wow. they had to leave quickly. So they, because they know the terrain very well, they set themselves up uh, at uh, near Bet Horon. And as the army is descending, they start to hurl projectiles down on them. Wow. And they, they manage to kill, Josephus says, like 5,300 uh, of them. Wow. I think that could be, you know, Josephus' numbers are almost always multiples of 10 or even 100. Um, <laughs> bigger than be like 500 you think it could be 500 it could be still 300. a lot it's a lot of people anyway 
Yeah. And it's enough. So the reason I go into all that explanation is to say the garrison uh, massacre was was one thing, but this thing now, the assault on that's the more. legion, that's really, I mean, there's there's no way that Rome can Can't take respond. this sitting down. There's absolutely no way. And there's going to be, there. you know, as the name of that film with Daniel Day-Lewis was, there will be blood. There will be blood, <laughs> yeah. especially after this. Yeah, and there so, will be blood. That, so you just explained to me how this war broke out really well. That makes a lot of sense. Now, now you know, and now you know how it escalates. And so I guess that since we have a few minutes left, I guess the things that I want to tie in now just to end this story off is like, and this might be, you might have to like speed through it. I don't know how you want to do this, but like, <laughs> how do you, how do we get from Nero sending legions to, to, to quell this rebellion or whatever you want to call it, this little scuffle or whatever you want to call it to the, the Gaius Windex thing and, and uh, what's his name? Galba becoming like literally like conspir conspiracy against Nero all the way in the, in the, in the, in the West in Spain, this is nothing to do with Judea. So it's really moved a lot of moving parts happening. And then you get yeah. you're, you're the four emperors. Yeah. So very quickly, um, uh, Nero's off on his Greek tour, having the time of his life, completely forgets about politics or tries to in Rome. But that has his year and a half, which he probably would have liked to extend even right. longer, um, falls apart because he gets news from Rome that there are all these senatorial conspiracies. And so he feels he has to go back. And he goes back and, um, but he's a busted flush. You know, by this point, there's lots of movement uh, against him. So in the West, yeah, you have you have the problem of Julius Windex, uh, their wonderful name. Sounds like window cleaner. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, it's, but it's, of course, Vindex. Oh, Vindex, but yeah. We, we, say it, we say it Windex. Yeah, um, I said that because I have, a, I have a Patreon member who is, his name is Gaius Julius Windex. Yeah, okay. Joke. So I literally slipped up and said his name instead, but yeah, it's been no, no, no. It's it's true. We normally pronounce uh, the V as a W, right? Um, yeah, that's probably yeah, what yeah. But it oh, does God. sound like window cleaner to us. Anyhow, this guy um, leads a, a little bit of a revolt, and there there are all kinds of personal reasons for these conflicts out in the western provinces, and uh, that that revolt doesn't last very long because it's put down by a a more loyal Roman, temporarily loyal Roman. Um, uh, uh, but but uh, Windex has written to all the regional governors asking who will join him. And most of them write back and say, no, no, no way. It's too dangerous. Um, That's a risky but move right there. Galba, Galba doesn't, <laughs> right. apparently. Galba says, hmm, well, let's see. And now he's already an old guy. He's right. uh, he's a blue blood who was brought out. You know, he's got a noble kind of ancestry, um, Sulpicius Galba, um, and he's you know he's well respected as a military guy. But he's pushing seventy, and he's finding it even difficult to ride a horse. You know, um, so his big deal is he has to get a successor uh, in place if he's going to last. Because part of the problem is that Nero was so young, he was not an experienced commander. He didn't have, you know, the whole Julio-Claudian succession line was really not working. Um, and was, you know, people adopted and fictional heirs and all of that. So really you want the, a, a, a military man, a trusted, you know, true Roman guy uh, who's got a, a proper son uh, or two. Um, and you don't have to go through all the usual shenanigans. Um, so anyway, what, what basically happens is Galba take, it manages to take over. He doesn't reach Rome until like October of 68. So, so Nero kills himself in June 9th or 11th, uh, depending uh, on, on your calculations. Um, and Galba is quickly uh, accepted as emperor in his place, but he doesn't reach Rome until October. And he finally realizes he's got to name somebody as his heir. And he chooses this guy, Licinianus Piso, um, and announces him in January of, uh, uh, of 69. 
and then he's they're both murdered um, in on January 15th. Apparently, uh, has something to do with with Otto, who thought that he should be because he'd been a loyal supporter. That he sh he's young, and he should be the natural heir. Uh, and so then you have this conflict between uh, Otto and Vitellius, because Vitellius also had arisen. He just came you know, back from Gaul from winning a bunch of battles in Gaul, if I'm not mistaken. Or is uh, that oh. he's in he's in uh in, in Germany. He's in Germany, one of the German, German provinces, yeah. yeah. And what and he just arrived. I mean, he'd just been sent out as uh as uh, as a general of Galba, but he already found the German legions in a kind of arrestive state. So so anyway, my point is that right from the beginning, you have this conflict between um, Otto and Vitellius for oh, like sure. right from the time of Galba's death, they are at, at each other about who will be the real successor. Otto takes over. He's recognized by the Senate, but Vitellius is always at his heels. And so it's a very short you know, few months that Otto is in power. And then Vitellius in the first battle of Cremona. Uh, the, doesn't Vitellius him. help Otho? Get they help him beat Galba or no? Maybe I'm wrong about that. Um, uh, well, yes and no. Um, <laughs> I mean, they're both opposed to Galba, it appears, but it's it's really their struggle between each other that yeah. will then then kick off. Anyhow, anyhow, the the point is um, that doesn't last for very long, and and by April, uh, Vitellius is in power, uh, but then he still has to get to Rome. Uh, uh, yeah, anyhow, um, that takes us far away from Judea. I, I did want to finish the Judean story. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Because the, the main point here is that's also, I think, widely misunderstood is people then think that this, this war that began as a result of everything we discussed, uh, lasted for like eight years. Well, even I was looking at a book that just came out recently. It's saying this was like one of the biggest wars of the Roman Empire because it lasted from 66 70. till 73 or 74 with the fall of Masada. So like eight years, maybe. But here's the crucial point. It didn't, didn't last that long by any means. First of all, the Romans thought it was over by 70 with the fall of Jerusalem because they held their triumph, the triumph of Vespasian and Titus in Rome for the fall of Judea, which is now in control, calm, subdued. Uh, they held that triumph in 71 in Rome uh, for Jerusalem having fallen in 70, about beginning of September of 70. That's the first thing. So it was only, only, uh, and the, the Flavians only arrived to take over. So what happened to this guy, Cestius Gallus, he never did return. So he was... He was rebuffed from Jerusalem, right? He went back north. His legion was attacked, and he escaped and got home to Antioch. And he was planning to return uh, with more legions uh, in uh, fighting season in the spring of 67. Uh, Nero decided, however, forget about it. Uh, you, old guy, he's also pushing 70 years old by this point. You old guy are no good. You're not gonna. It's not gonna happen with you. I am sending this vigorous, you know, mid fifties guy who's got lots of military experience. He fought uh, Claudius's battles for him. Led the second legion in Britain back in you know forty three. So and and gave Claudius his triumph. So this is a very accomplished military commander. I'm sending him, and he's not a threat to me because he's a new senator. He's not like old blue blood senator. He's not a threat to me. So he sends uh, Vespasian out basically to take over from Cestius Gallus and put down all this unrest in Jerusalem, simply like that. But what I may, mainly want to point out is the war, the so-called war uh, that followed was not much of a war. Uh, I mean, Judea did not have an army, right? Unlike provincial revolts like the Batavian revolt or the German revolts where they had auxiliary forces that were in revolt in Judea, the auxiliary forces were on the Roman side. 
um, there were no Judean auxiliary forces. So it's not like there was really a war. When Vespasian arrived in uh, Ptolemais, so this is uh, Akko today, at the northwest corner of Galilee, before he even entered Judean territory, all the cities of the region, including Judean Sepphoris, the major Judean city in Galilee, sent representatives to him saying, welcome, welcome. Uh, we are so glad to see you. Uh, and, and Agrippa was with him as an ally. He said, please, you know, uh, our place is your place. You know, mi casa su casa. Um, please send a, uh, a, a, a um, garrison uh, to Sepphoris of, of several thousand Roman soldiers. Set up a garrison right in our city. Perfect. We'd love to have you. And from that point on, and, and Tiberius also on the coast of the Lake of Galilee, sent delegates, as did all the diaspora, uh, the um, Decapolis, pardon me, uh, cities, sent delegates to welcome him. So, so Vespasian basically had the run of the place wow. uh, right from the beginning. He only had uh, the problem with Yotapata or Yodfat, where Josephus uh, was, that lasted a few weeks. And then he went to help King Agrippa. So he sent his men to winter quarters after that in July of 67 already. Uh, like it was over. There was nothing to do. But Agrippa, his host, said, you know what? I have a couple of cities that are giving me, Agrippa, a problem because they've just been given to me by Nero. Uh, and they don't like this situation. That's Tiberius and, uh, on, the, on the shore of the lake. And Tarikea. Uh, they're giving me a hassle. Would you help me? Would you help intimidate them into submission to me? And, uh, and, and Vespasian said, well, sure, why not? I've got a massive army here doing nothing. Uh, so, yeah. So that's where the siege of uh, Gamla uh, comes up because it's in Agrippa's territory. But it wasn't on Vespasian's itinerary initially. So Vespasian wraps up Galilee very quickly in 67, right? It's done uh, almost when he arrives. And then in 68, he moves down to Caesarea to launch his, uh, to, to tighten the noose around Jerusalem and, and restore, you know, order there. And that's when Nero dies. Nero dies in June of 68. So Vespasian has already garrisoned Judea without any real resistance in 68. And then Nero dies. So he puts his campaign on hold for two years while the Roman civil war plays out. So my point, Neil, is that uh, there's no like fighting war. For, it's not like there's a fighting war for eight years. Uh, most of this is simply Vespasian sitting around waiting. Waiting for the year of the four emperors to end. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then it ends with him, you know, making a bid for power himself. Now, and then, and then he decides to hand off the the siege of Jerusalem. By the way, I think it it shows that he really didn't think it was a big deal, uh, because he gave it to his young son, uh, who's thirty years old now, to take care of. Puts Tiberius Julius Alexander in there to help him, and Vespasian doesn't go back to Rome. He goes over to Alexandria and sits there while the siege of Jerusalem is going on. So he could have done it himself, but he handed it to his son, which suggests, I think, to me at least, that he he thought it would be a great way for Titus to get some military credit and credibility Otto, yeah. as his heir, right? Yeah, yeah. And so when what the, I was looking this up while you were telling this because I, I thought of this. And if you go to Vespasian's Wikipedia page, there's this map right here. Have you ever seen this okay. before? Probably. I don't remember. So it's OK. So the, I, I'm wondering what these dates mean. It's got Galba, June. It's, well, that's, that's when he's run, running. Uh, that's when he's the emperor. But if you look, look at the uh, regions. It has Vespasian and it has him on the Eastern Empire, Syria, Egypt, but also Macedonia and Dalmatia. Are these is this is this true? Like, are these like the areas that proclaimed each person as emperor? Like they supported them, basically. Well, it's more. It's the thing is, it's more dynamic, right? So, this, so Otto and Vitellius had their uh, supporting areas, right? right? 
That's what they're saying. Um, but Galba's out of the picture by right, so you can't really. Well, it says, it says on the bottom sixty nine. It's over with. Yeah, he, as I said, yeah, he he's murdered in yeah. the forum on the fifteenth of January right. of sixty nine. So he's out of the picture. Right. When Otto and Vitellius are going at it. Sure. Right? So so each of them has their own uh, sort of legionary support, and sure. they they fight it out in a battle in northern Italy at a place called Cremona, or between the town of Cremona and Bedriacum which are, you know, I don't know, days march apart. Between those two towns, so one each based in one of them, they fight it out between those towns. And they, like, they have tens of thousands of Roman soldiers fighting each other, right? Yeah. And so finally, Vitalius emerges uh, from that in, in, in April, right? right. Um, uh, Otto, Otto kills himself, right? Yeah. Because according to the story, he actually could have won it but he decides that the fighting has been too yes too too fierce and yeah. there's too much roman the loss Tacitus tells us that yeah yeah so he uh he up and kills himself now and then so vitellius okay. is now is now in power but uh he hasn't actually been been fighting himself these are forces fighting on his behalf so he's now he's now um, emperor, uh, oh. but the thing is that what I'm trying to say is that Vespasian then is not has not been part of that. Right, right. right, it's, right. He he now launches his own. In in other words, he launches a new civil war in Rome because Vitellius thinks he's finally got it all sewn up. Right. right? Vitellius even issues some coins showing victory in Judea. Oh wow! Like, because he's sure that Vespasian has it all tied up in in Judea, so he issues some coins with the palm tree and victory fastening her shield on the palm tree, uh, because he thinks Vespasian has won Judea for him, right? Because he's emperor, and what he doesn't realize is <laughs> Vespasian's about to turn around and challenge him for for imperial power. Yeah. So the last thing I want to ask you, and we'll, uh, then we'll finish this. This has been amazing, by the way. Um, so is this, would you say that it, it's accurate that the East supported Vespasian to return to Rome as the emperor while well, Vespasian is in power? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, basically. So I'm not saying before that, but like his, his uh, power base is, first of all, the legions in, in Judea yeah. with him, right? So he's, he's got three legions. Uh, at this point in Judea, then when he decides to make the bid for power, according to Josephus, he writes to Tiberius Julius Alexander, who is the governor of Egypt at this time. And if he did this show on HBO, he'd be one of the main characters. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And he pledges uh, support of his two legions. Uh, now, according to the, 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 here's an interesting thing: there are two different stories. The Flavian story is that Tiberius Julius Alexander did this independently. He saw where the where the sun was rising, and he he made his calculation and decided to throw his support behind Vespasian. Right. And he did it because he had heard that the the uh, legions up on the Danube, so in the eastern part of the empire up on the Danube, would support Vespasian. And we're inclined because Vespasian's a successful guy now, right? He's he's got another military campaign under his belt, and they see him as a true leader, a real a real commander. So they will support him. So Tiberius Julius Alexander independently supports him as well. And when you put all that together with Vespasian's three legions, he's got a solid base for making a bid for power. Uh, the the four legions in Syria. Right, because of Mukianus, who's now the governor there, are supporting him. Three legions in Judea, two legions in Alexandria, and several legions on the Danube. So he's got a really solid support base. So Vespasian that's that's the Flavian story. Yeah. Josephus's story is that Vespasian actually has to, once he makes his bid for power, he actually writes to Tiberius Julius Alexander and says, "Hey." 
I've got the support of Syria, four legions, Judea, three legions. Would you throw in your support behind me? And Tiberius Julius Alexander agrees. And he also um, had, he also had Nerva and Domitian fighting in Dacia. There had, if I'm not mistaken, isn't that where Domitian was going to war? Or is that later? That that's later. later. Okay, that's later. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm, just, I'm yeah. just trying to get the picture. Okay, that's later. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's like 20 years later. Yeah. And I just pulled up that uh, it's just from Wikipedia, but just to get your opinion on it, it says that there was a damaged papyrus re refers to Alexander Tiberius as holding Praetorian prefect, which is open to two interpretation. It could indicate his rank during Titus campaign in 70, which would mean that he held his own independent imperium commanding authority. Another right. another would be he became the prefect Praetorian guard at Rome, which later yeah. became a composition for prefects in Egypt. Yeah, this is what we were talking about early on uh, in our conversation. Yeah. That that's what I mentioned that there was um I may have called it an inscription. It's a, it's a papyrus. Yes, yes, yeah. yes. Um that uh depends on how you read it. Um uh, indicates that he Tiberius Julius Alexander became a Praetorian prefect with Titus alongside him. And wow. that, that, that view has been, uh, so in the seventies, right? Yeah. So after he helped win, after he helped Titus, uh, subdue Jerusalem, then he became, uh, co Praetorian prefect. Um, but that's not clear. Uh, sure. it's not, th this is a, is a fragmentary papyrus and right. it has to be filled in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one thing I think we can say to close this out is that Vespasian really, it was like sort of a genius in his own way where he had the insight to know what to do, what moves to make, when to wait it out, when to be aggressive, when to back off and sort of wait off the storm and then enter back with a big triumphal, like I'm the hero. Look, I'm back. Everything's fine now. Oh, yeah. So. Oh yeah, I mean that 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 comes through very clearly. I've written a couple articles about this. Um, what a what a cautious and clever uh, general and commander and politician he was. Even in so when his men acclaim him imperator, it's you know conqueror. They they wanted him, the Spasian, to lead them against Vitellius. Right. They assumed that he would be their commander in the field because he was their commander in Judea. But what he did was he worked out a deal with Mucianus, the governor of Syria, who would actually lead the Flavian forces to, to Italy to fight against um, Vitellius's forces. Vespasian hung out in Alexandria for almost a year. Right? But his brother did die as a result of that. His brother died in that little skirmish. His, his older brother, that's right, yeah. Flavius Sabinus, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that was probably probably not his fault because right. that's, that's when uh, the Flavian forces are, you know, uh, just outside of Rome, yeah. And so Vitellius's forces, according to most stories, it wasn't Vitellius himself, but right. his forces who, uh, you know, got, got furious and grabbed Flavius Sabinus. But the amazing thing is that Vitellius had had made him the city prefect of right. Vespasian's brother, right? He, he had no trouble with uh, keeping him as uh, prefect of, of Rome. So anyway, yeah, 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 yeah. He is, he, he's a very cautious, very clever, and, and self-protecting um, commander. So he gets it done, but he also looks after himself very well. So he, he wasn't anywhere near the fighting in Italy, and he waltzes into Rome when it's all been completely settled and calmed down and all the, the, the bloodletting is over and he can just take control. Yep. Yeah. And then Titus comes back later on with those, uh, with Simon and, uh, John, the two slaves that he's and, got. Vespa and, and Josephus. Yeah. Yeah. And Josephus. Yeah. So yeah. that's the end. That's, that's how it ends. And it's really fascinating how you get from this Julio Claudian, it's like super godly dynasty. And then it's just like, gone and now you have this new era in rome it's yeah. really a fascinating story of how things change how people how 
how just things change. Like nothing stays the same. It's always been, yeah. you know, it's just, it really is one of those crazy, they should yeah. make a show out of it. They really should. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. What do you, now last thing I want to ask you, where, where do you think the show would start and where do you think it would end? <laughs> yeah, I guess with, it was Nero where you started. Yeah. Um, I think that's, uh, that would make a good starting point. So, you know, things looking all, all right with yeah, Nero. Nero becoming the emperor as a yeah, yeah, 16 yeah. year old and then ending on like the triumph of Vespasian or something. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That'd be good. That'd be a really good series. I think so. Yeah. If HBO ever did a series on this, like Game of Thrones, but like Rome edition, that would be a good scene right there. Like you got the next yeah. coming hero, Vespasian, and you have the bad guy and they're like, He's, yeah. you know, like this, you could, you, you could see this being a amazing drama. You couldn't yeah, do yeah, it in yeah, one movie. Yeah. You would have yeah. to have like a five season show. <laughs> this, yeah. But yeah, I think so. You know, there was this fantastic series uh, called Rome, uh, HBO series about, I, uh, about Julius Caesar to a, yeah. Octavian. Yeah. I watched it. I've seen the whole entire thing. And I found yeah. out from someone who's a friend of mine, who's like obsessed with the show that, the same directors and writers of Game of Thrones, they were supposed to have another like two seasons of Rome after that. Okay. Now, if you remember from the show, they introduced Herod as one of the characters in the second season. Yeah. Well, he, that, he was supposed to lead up till he was supposed to lead up to the next season where Augustus yeah. like becomes becomes the real deal. But the show got canceled and replaced by Game of Thrones. So well, I heard that the I heard that the set, which they had elaborately created burned down oh wow i didn't know that either yeah and that's what i heard yeah the set, the set was destroyed which which is what i heard was the reason why they you know they didn't try to continue it but it was yeah. brilliant right i mean it was yeah. a, like the 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 the, the um, production values i guess the term is were Great outstanding shape. and yeah. the research was hugely impressive yeah except that I don't know if you remember, but they always had, not always, but occasionally they had a Judean pop in to the show. And this person was a raging anti-Roman zealot. That yeah. one character, the short guy who's like, he's struggling with his family and he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Rome. but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, and that fits in with this picture that goes all the way through to the life of Brian, goes all the way back to Ben-Hur from the 19th century, this book that was made into a film a couple of times in the 20th and I think even early 21st century was redone, uh, Ben-Hur. But there's always this, you know, this conflict between Jews and Rome. Uh, you know, we've got to throw off the, the power of Rome. I think it has more to do with American, um, uh, you know. Interpretation. Freedom values like America, America's oh, yeah. founding, founding story of breaking away from British, you know. Because if you notice, the Romans are always played by Brits, well, right. like guys with English accents, uh, British accents, and the and the rebels are always with American accents. Wow, that's um, a really good point. Yeah, and if like the series um, Masada with Peter O'Toole and Peter Strauss, I think way back when around the 1980 or so was the same thing, right? So wow. you have uh, you have Elazar at Masada, who's an American. Uh, fight well, American accented uh, Jew fighting for freedom against these old British uh, uh, Roman types um, who are the colonial power. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. But so I think all that gets mixed up into it, you know. Um, yeah, well, it's relative to what we're saying because it, we get this impression that it's, there's this like s like black and white, like the rebels yeah. and then the Romans, and like yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, listen, thank you so much for your time. I can't express how much I appreciate you giving me your time like this because I know there's only so many times, so many hours in a day, so many days in a year. And I appreciate this. And I hope we could do this again in a couple months or something. And uh, anything else you want to say? Uh, any books coming out or anything? Uh, I, I do have a book that just appeared, but it's one of the. Um, so there's Josephus's works, and I edit a thing that is a commentary on all the works of Josephus. So one of the volumes has just appeared, which is my commentary on book four of the Judean War with a new translation. It just came out, but I don't expect people to get it. But since you asked, uh, yeah, I do have yeah. a new book out. Yeah. I'll put a link in the description. I'm sure somebody out there is going to want to 
take a look at okay. that. Okay, they're they're expensive. They're from this Dutch publisher, Brill, which is an academic publisher. Very nice hard hard copy, acid free paper. You know, sewn bindings. They'll last forever. But they're library quality uh, books, and they don't you know they they don't uh, intend to sell them to ordinary folks. Um, I wouldn't buy them myself. Well, if can I, people can people get them at libraries? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They can get them at libraries, and uh, you can get them online uh, from Brill. You can subscribe to their online um, Josephus as well. Yeah. There you go, guys. There you go. That's how you can find it out. So um, thank you for your time, and you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.